This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. And by Cafe Himbo Cookbooks, celebrating his 10th anniversary. Thank you. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and the bigger they are, the harder the crummy adaptations hit. There is no question that South Pacific is one of the brightest jewels in the music theater canon. The second musical to win the Pulitzer Prize for Drama, it contains some of Rodgers and Hammerstein's most exquisite and beloved melodies. And, all things considered, it's aged a lot better than some of the stuff from its era. The theme of confronting one's unexamined racism is timeless and universal, as recent events have shown us. Which explains why our next Defender, the 2001 made-for-television adaptation, happened, though not the results. This particular production was one of many to come out of the filmed-for-television musicals trend at the turn of the millennium, an era that gave us the Kathy Bates Annie, the Whitney Houston Brandy Cinderella, and the Matthew Broderick mess of a music man. South Pacific followed a similar mold. Take a couple of big-name stars, in this case Glenn Close and Harry Connick Jr., throw in some good production values, tweak the script to bring it more in line with modern sensibilities, and you're good to go, right? Yeah, not so much. Let's examine the case of South Pacific 2001. The movie does have the advantage of starting out with a good old Richard Rogers overture, so we can enjoy some beautiful tunes with our establishing shots and credits. Robert Pastorelli. Why do I know that name? Oh, of course. Uh, rather active in film and television, had a regular role on Murphy Brown, career took a downturn when his girlfriend died under mysterious circumstances, and he ended up taking his own life when police started investigating her murder? Okay, moving on then! We get the first glimpses of our lead actors as Connick Jr.'s Lieutenant Joe Cable is flown to a remote post in the Pacific Theater, where Close's Nellie Forbush is already welcoming some new nursing recruits. We're so happy you're here. Boy, are we ever. Thanks to you, some of the girls who've been out here since the beginning can go home. First and foremost, Glenn Close is all wrong for this character. To begin with, she's the wrong age. And I get what they're going for. Naivete and optimism are not the exclusive provenances of the young. Personal development is a lifelong journey and all that. But quite apart from the fact that you still have lyrics describing the character as a little girl, it is practically impossible to make Glenn Close look anything but poised and sophisticated. What do you say we slip away and take a little late night swim? I think that's a great idea. Will Marie and the kids be joining us? Then there's Nellie's relationship with Emile de Beck. Now, May-December romances might rub you the wrong way, and, again, that's understandable. But love it or hate it, it is a vital aspect of the way these particular characters react to each other, and trying to erase it goes against the tenor of their arc, not to mention the songs. This is what I need, this is what I've longed for, someone young and smiling, climbing up my heel. Cable also arrives and is immediately accosted by the sweaty, tattooed Luther Billis, who specializes in laundry, assorted contraband, and general comic relief. Billis quickly explains how things stand on the island. Pretty much everyone is hanging around waiting for war stuff to happen, and the only women around are the nurses, who are off-limits to NCOs, and the local ladies across the way on Bally High, who are off-limits to everybody. And so, we get the world's greatest tribute to blue balls. It's a waste of time to worry over things that they have not. Be thankful for the things they got. This movie generally aims for a more realistic approach, and there are some specific issues with that we'll talk about later, but overall the results are definitely a mixed bag. There is nothing like a dame as a case in point. There are some effective touches. Note the brief but pointed scene of black soldiers segregated in their own mess hall. But at other times, the sexual frustration goes from playful to kind of threatening. Yeah, 
like that. Did I mention this was filmed two years after the aforementioned mysterious death of Pastorelli's girlfriend? That night, there is a party at the officers' club. Local planter and general man of mystery, Emile de Beck, is in attendance, and while he and Nellie see each other across crowded rooms, Cable is called in by resident brass, Captain Brackett, to do super-secret military stuff. Operation Alligator. So it is on. Yes, sir. An offensive strike against the Japanese. This movie spends a decent fraction of its running time on the super-secret war stuff, which is sin number two. There is a difference between a story being set during a war and a story being about a war. South Pacific is the former. It's not invested in strategy or tactics or battles. It's about relationships that are complicated by the fact that a war is happening. We don't need to hear all the details about Operation Alligator or keep checking in on the progress of building a fighter plane ready runway. In fact, that takes away from what is really the main draw of the story. Can it be built and ready for action in two weeks? You can write your own ticket. Anything you want. Man, equipment, it's yours. <sighs> Nothing says romantic drama like military infrastructure. In between songs, the soldiers kill time by buying souvenirs and singing the praises of local entrepreneur Bloody Mary. Her skin is tender as We come now to the curious dichotomy of South Pacific. The overarching anti-racist theme of the musical was quite progressive for its time, and remains relevant to this day. But as far as actual Asian representation goes, it was the 1940s. This movie does try to update things a bit, giving Bloody Mary a bit more character development, and even allowing Liot a few lines in English. It's not a perfect solution, but they did at least try. Bloody Mary sees Cable staring at her, and she kind of flirts with him and offers him a seashell from Bally High, which she describes in one of the most haunting songs ever. Bally High may call you You gotta love how Bloody Mary becomes a lot more fluent in English the moment she starts singing. She must take the same language course as Maria. Cable gets a longing for the place Bloody Mary sings about, and who wouldn't, and he spends a lot of time talking to her and learning about the locals, particularly Emile, who Bloody Mary explains is very familiar with the surrounding islands. Cable, who needs a scout to help him spy on the Japanese troop movements in the area, finds this very interesting. Speaking of Emile, he's meeting Nellie at his plantation, and she's theoretically getting swept off her feet. Thank you. Although I think the only sweeping being done is by the housekeepers who keep that hardwood floor immaculate. Sin number three is perhaps this movie's most telling failing. It doesn't trust the love story it's trying to sell us. The romance of South Pacific is not intended to be looked at with a critical eye. Neither of the two main couples know each other very well, one of them has a significant age gap, and the other a significant language barrier. But that doesn't matter. This is the type of story where love at first sight is a given, sincerity is proven in an outpouring of song, and broken hearts can prove fatal. The kind of story, in short, that makes for a good musical. But the writers keep trying to help things along where help is not only not needed, but counterproductive. For example, in the stage version, Nellie and Emile's relationship begins in media res. We know they've only known each other for a short time, but we can see there's already a mutual attraction, and that's enough to go on. This version starts with their first meeting, but instead of making their attraction more plausible, it just makes us think about how they've only spoken to each other twice which then makes us think about other things we're not supposed to examine more closely, like how Emile and Nellie don't seem to have a whole lot in common, and Joe and Liot can barely carry on a conversation, and Bloody Mary's matchmaking of the two comes dangerously close to actively pimping Liot out, and before you know it, the whole premise collapses. 
Then again, Ray Trebegia's rendition of Some Enchanted Evening isn't exactly the passionate declaration of love it's meant to be, either. Some enchanted evening When you find your true love Yeah, his vibrato is killing me, to say nothing of his tepid performance. Even if Close didn't look too grounded to be carried away by anything, I'd have a hard time believing Nellie would fall for this guy. Nellie has to get on duty, but before she leaves, Emile confesses that he left France because he killed a man, which also happens to kill the mood. Meanwhile, Billis is getting Cable to requisition a boat so they can check out Bally High together. Bloody Mary immediately claims Cable's attention and takes him to her picturesque homestead and equally picturesque daughter Liot while Billis takes in some of the local color. I mean, I know there was a scene like that in the original movie, but sweet Lucifer! Cable and Liot are getting along swimmingly, but the same can't be said for Nellie. Between Brackett asking her to look more into this killing a guy thing because he's trying to vet Emile for the scouting mission, and overhearing some loudmouth talking about how Emile was practically drowning in Hot Island Loving back in the day, Nellie's realizing she doesn't know a whole lot about him. So she decides to drop the relationship altogether and get a kicking ensemble number out of it. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. I'm gonna wash that man. Nellie's resolve lasts about as long as it takes Emile to come riding up the beach on horseback, but she retains her composure enough to delve a little deeper into his backstory. I wanted to ask you, um, because I always think it's interesting why a person kills another person. Wow, I'm surprised Emile isn't questioning their relationship at this point. But it's all good, as he explains his victim was the local bully and card sharp who cheated him out of his life savings before threatening Emile's life. It's basically the Curly McLean defense, but with gambling. With the air cleared, Emile asks Nellie to be his wife in a way that will really make you miss Brian Stokes Mitchell. When you find your true love, when you feel a call you... All right, I'll marry you. Just quit singing like that. Nellie is thrilled, and even the female chorus laughing at her hypocrisy isn't enough to dim her spirits. So is Emile, so much so that he turns down Cable's offer to go on a certain death foray into enemy territory. Cable accuses him of putting love over duty, although since he's been going AWOL to hang out with Liat, he probably shouldn't talk. It belonged to my grandfather. My dad carried it all through the last war. Sort of a good luck piece. If that doesn't scream tragic keepsake, I don't know what does. Bloody Mary comes in and says one of the local planters has been asking for Liat's hand, but she'd much rather have Cable for a son-in-law. Cable reluctantly refuses, since Liat's Asian, and therefore good concubine material, but not good wife material. Speaking of, this musical has always glossed over the fact that Joe's been ballying Liat's high while having a girl waiting for him back home. I don't know who this gal is, but she needs to form a support group with Ellen from Miss Saigon. Back on the main island, Nellie is having her own miscegenation crisis, as she loves how Emile makes her feel worldly and sophisticated until she discovers his relationships have been more worldly than she'd bargained for. I'm the father. And their mother was colored. She was dark, yes. Such a shock. I, I mean, it's su such a surprise. You have children. I, I didn't expect it, that's all. Nelly. It's the color that upsets you. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I'm not racist. Whoops, look at the time. I have to go. Uh, iron my hair. I'll call you, really? For his own part, Cable is mourning the loss of Liat by drinking and getting into fights with minor characters. How you doing, old <laughs> You got something to say, you say it to my face, pal. Do you believe this guy's nerve? Right. This is where the movie really messes up. 
The point of South Pacific is that racism isn't exclusive to hooded, torch-bearing mobs, but is often ordinary people who are perfectly decent until confronted by something outside their comfort zone. But when it comes time to deliver that message, this adaptation fumbles it like a drunk, disgruntled FedEx driver. First, there's this fight scene. We did not need an overt bigot to hammer home the racism sucks message. In fact, it feels like it's trying to excuse Cable's behavior. Sure, he refuses to make an honest woman of the Tonkin girl he's been boffing, but he's not mocking her mom's accent, so he's not that bad. Then there's the result of Cable getting his ass handed to him, which is that Brackett calls off the mission entirely because... he's unreliable, getting too friendly with the locals... It's never fully explained, and it makes Cable's gut punch so low you've got to be carefully taught sound more like he's regretting letting his country down rather than losing the girl he loves. Not to mention how tepid Connick Jr.'s performance of said song is. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly but let's put aside this grim social commentary for the base's Thanksgiving spectacular featuring sin number seven, Honey Bun. I'm almost impressed that the movie managed to mess this song up, as it's surely the biggest no-brainer in the show. Nellie performs a song dressed as a sailor, while Billis, somewhat reluctantly, dons horrendous drag to play the sailor's petite firecracker of a girlfriend. That's it. That's the joke. It's a silly, amateur cross-dressing cabaret act that provides a few laughs to lighten the increasingly dark mood. But that's not enough for this movie. Oh no, it wants justification. So yeah, apparently someone thought we needed to know the reason why Billis is getting all dolled up, which is that Nellie's original partner bailed because vague relationship reasons. And then for some reason, after they get through the number, the orchestra soars like they've just raised enough money to save the orphanage. (laughs) Emil makes one last-ditch effort at reconciling with Nellie, but she refuses, admitting her prejudice is illogical, but she's stuck with it. Meanwhile, Cable has decided he's going to defy orders and go on his mission anyway, and Emil is all, sure, that having something to live for didn't work out, so let's go. Nellie decides she's going to give not being racist a try, too late to stop Emil from leaving, but just in time to get to know her prospective stepkids. Cable and Emil start relaying troop information, but it takes all of 50 seconds for the Japanese forces to pick up their transmission, and they have to run for it. While pausing for breath, Cable admits he plans to stay in the islands once the war is over, as everything he loves is right here. So I'm sure everything will turn out... (laughs) Or not. Emil tries to escape with the aid of the plucky comic relief, but their plane is shot down and the survival of the passengers is in doubt. Nevertheless, Nellie soldiers on, pun not intended, as the troops gradually get ready to go to war. Billis and the pilot turn up alive, which does take away from the drama of Emile's grand re-entry. But hey, this movie has done very little right so far, so why should it start now? Look, I get it. South Pacific is timeless in some places and dated in others, so if you're going to revisit this, and it should be revisited for the fantastic score if nothing else, you need to change some things. But the 2001 movie seems to have done this without understanding what needed to be changed and what needed to be left alone. As a result, the questionable parts become more glaring and the good parts are robbed of their effect. Therefore, the Court of Musical Hell orders the following punishments. For being a tepid leading man, Ray Cherbegia is condemned to take remedial classes from the most interesting man in the world. For failing to cast an age-appropriate leading lady, Christine King and Marjorie Simkin are condemned to read the entirety of Norma Desmond's Salome script. 
and for getting too much war in his romance movie, Lawrence D. Cohen is condemned to read the entire Fifty Shades trilogy during an earthquake. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned.